preceded. This morning, as we reflect on the gospel reading, a very popular reading, the Pharisee and the publican or the tax collector, we need to realize that we have been given a privilege. We have the privilege of getting into our vehicles or walking to this house of prayer to worship. Unfortunately, and this is not to judge, but the privilege of going to church is a privilege that many of us take for granted. And I say that because, honestly, how much preparation do we put into going to church? Outside of making sure the dress or the shirt or the pants can fit, how prepared are we when we get to this place? How much time do we spend getting our hearts ready for our corporate worship, as we say? Do we pray for the services? Do we seek the Lord's face and ask him to move in power when we come together? Or do we just come without even giving it a second thought? The Bible has something to say about how we go to church. And we can find that in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. In the passage before us today, the Lord Jesus allows us a glimpse into the temple of some people gathered to worship. In this parable, we see that one man came to church that day to worship himself. The other man came to church that day to worship the Lord. I want us to take a few minutes to contrast these two men because they teach us some much needed lessons about how we should come to church. First, we have two kinds of people, a Pharisee and a tax collector. One of the men who came to church that day was a Pharisee. He was a spiritual leader among the people. He was known and respected as a true man of God. He knew the scriptures. He had many passages committed to memory. He would have prayed at least three times every day. He fasted twice every week. And this is where things get a little sketchy. The Jews fasted on Mondays and Thursdays, which ironically were the same days they went to the market. And the practice of the Pharisees was to make their fasting very public. If you go back to Matthew 6, 16 to 18, they would not comb the hair or wash their faces, and this is what Jesus spoke about. And they wore the most wrinkled and rumpled clothes they could find. They even put ashes on their faces to make themselves look as though they were peeled from fasting. This man tied on everything he possessed, even the herbs he grew in his garden. And we can go to Matthew 23, 23 for this, often given between 20 to 30 percent to the needs of the temple. The Pharisees were noted for making a public show in their tithing. What we have here is a very religious man considered to be holy by everyone who saw him. He loved the adoration that came his way from the people, the common people around him. This man is a picture of many of us in church. Then we have the publican, the tax collector. The other man who came to pray that day, he was a spiritual outcast. While he was welcome to come to the temple to pray in the court of the Jews, he would not have been allowed to attend the meetings at synagogue. The other Jews hated him and looked down on him. He was a tax collector. He worked for Rome, the nation that dominated and ruled Israel at the time. This is important to understand. Rome collected three kinds of taxes from the people that she conquered. They collected a land tax, a head tax, and a custom tax. These taxes were collected in a three-tier system. In that system, Rome levied the taxes. They were collected by a chief tax collector. 
Example, Zacchaeus, who controlled the work of several tax collectors. Example, Matthew. The chief tax collector could pay room, or sorry, would pay room for a certain area or district which gave him the authority to collect the taxes there. He would in turn sublease that area to tax collectors. So he's not doing the work, other people can do the work for him. The chief tax collector, however, could set his own rates and the men who worked for him could set their own rates too. As a result, Rome received its taxes, but the chief tax collector and the local tax collectors grew wealthy from extorting large sums of money from the common people as a tax collector. This man would have known, would be known for his greed and his dishonesty. So we don't like him. He has no right in church. He would have been viewed as a traitor to Israel and not even worthy of any compassion or concern from the Jews around him. This man is a picture of the other element we find in church. These are the people who do not act like we like them to, or they should. They might not dress like we think they should. They might not do the things and say the things just like we think they should. Like the publican, these folk are in church too, and like the publican, these folk are often looked down on by other folk who think they are more spiritual than they are. So those are two types of people. Then we have two types of prayers. Both of these men, the self-righteous Pharisee and the wicked publican went to the temple to pray. When they opened their mouths and began to speak, the true character of their hearts is put on display. As it turns out, you really can't judge a book by its cover. The man everyone thought was righteous was really a hypocrite. Well, the Lord accepted the man everybody looks down on. And if we examine the prayers of these two men, their words and their attitudes have something to teach us about how we should approach God and how we should see others as well. First, we get a haughty prayer. When the Pharisee begins to pray, he is quick to tell the Lord how things really are. He brags about his righteousness by comparing himself to other men. He even sees the publican praying nearby and talks about how much better he is than that man. William Barclay records the following. It is on record that Rabbi Simeon once said, if there are only two righteous men in the world, I and my son are those two men. If there is only one, I am he. The Pharisee did not really go to pray. He went to inform God how good he was. He brags about his religious work. He brags about his giving. He tells the Lord how great he is and how well he is doing. As he compares himself to others, he feels that he has arrived in the eyes of God. It was common for the Pharisees to stand when they prayed. They would spread their arms, lift their voices as loud as they could, and they would launch into long, complicated, self-serving prayer. He feels like he is talking to God. In truth, he is only talking to himself, about himself. His prayer got no higher than the roof of his mouth. God help us never to be like this man. Then we have a humble prayer. The publican does not offer any swelling words of self-glorification. He knows that he has nothing at all to offer the Lord. He knows he is a wicked sinner. When he prays, there is no pride, no pretense, no hint of himself, no hint of self-righteousness, and there are no attempts to justify himself or his lifestyle in the eyes of the Lord. He just tells the truth, humbles himself before God and acts for mercy. He won't even lift his eyes toward heaven. And that is where we find ourselves. Because he beats his breast, knowing that his real problems are problems of the heart. The Pharisee, on the other hand, is blissfully unaware that anything is wrong with his heart. His prayer is short, simple, and to the point. We could learn a lot from this man and his style of prayer. 
There's a hymn in our hymnal that I don't know the tune to, but the words struck me and I'll share them with you. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. The motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer, the sublimest strain that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his way. With angels in their sound rejoice and cry, behold, he prays. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native ear. His watchword at the gates of death, he enters heaven with prayer. O thou by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself has trod, Lord, teach us how to pray. Hymn 488. The prayer of the Pharisee was indicative of the praying of most self-righteous Jews in that era. Here are a few of the problems that had crept into prayer in Jesus' day. And unfortunately, some of these problems seem to have crept into prayer and worship in our time as well. Prayer has become nothing more than a ritual. The Jew prayed, but his prayers were scripted and the form was set. His prayers were not from or of his heart. Predetermined prayers were formulated for every aspect of life. We now have books, we have the internet, and we can find prayers for every aspect of our lives. Prayer was limited to preset times and occasions. We have a particular time to pray as well. Some of us pray when we get up, some of us pray before we go to bed. Is that the only time to pray? Long prayers were held in high regard. Sometimes the sweeter the language, we assume the better the prayer. Many prayers were comprised of meaningless repetition. The desire to be seen and heard by others. Unfortunately, many of these problems which the Jews have, we now have. God is not impressed with the length, volume, and vocabulary of our prayer. The publican's prayer was short, simple, and to the point. And his prayer was heard. We need to understand that we need to become prayer. That prayer is not something to say. Prayer is something to offer. We need to realize that God only wants us. We therefore need to become prayer. Because we see that one man was received by God and one man was refused by God. This parable was told to the Pharisees. Jesus wanted these self-righteous hypocrites to understand that the way up in the eyes of the Lord is down. The way to be honored by the Lord is to realize that you are nothing before the Lord. The way to forgiveness is through confession of sin. The way to be right with the Lord is to realize just how wrong we are. Jesus wanted them to know that they should never be in the business of judging others. But we should be in the business of judging ourselves. Jesus wanted them to know that they were not to focus their attention on the lives of others, but they were to worry about their own walk with the Lord. 
We are all guilty of this from time to time. We all have those little areas of irritation. Things that just rub us the wrong way. But we need to realize we are all different. We are all diverse. All made by God, which means as different or as strange as that other person may seem, that person is perfect because they were made by God. But we somehow assume what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is normal and what is abnormal. And we see that in the society in which we live and we have some struggles which make no sense at all. But we're making strides. We used to use a word that is somewhat offensive now. Remember we used to say as a person retarded? And we shut away those persons because they were not to be seen. Because they were not normal. And we weaved our way through this process and we got to differently able. We had challenged. We had special. These people are God's people. But we look down on these persons and when we see them, we steer. Honestly, I can understand the steers because for so long, these persons were not in our midst. But the thing is, are these persons not made perfect? Are these not God's people? Do we not understand that they too have a purpose? This thinking presents a problem for the church where, yes, we acknowledge we are all different, we all have different roles to play. But our biggest challenge is accepting each other's differences. Because we want everybody to be just like we are. And when you're not like we are, when you're not doing the things that we are doing, we push you aside. And then we speak about the love of God. Do we really understand the love of God? Because it is not to judge. When we look at the whole argument surrounding human sexuality, on a personal level, we can decide if homosexuals or other sexuals are right or wrong. But is it our job to judge? Or is it simply our job to love? We accept persons with and for their differences and do the work of God. And when you really think about it, that is not where we are. That is not what we're doing because the argument continues. The struggle continues. And we struggle because I am better than you are. I am right. You are wrong. You need to fall in line with me. One man went to church and left with nothing. He went through the rituals, he judged others by his standards, he prayed his self-righteous prayer, he worshipped himself. This man went home feeling good about himself, but he received nothing from God for his efforts. Often, we come and we are so happy with ourselves and what we can do and what we can offer, we don't even realize that we've received nothing. The other man went to church and left with everything. He didn't make a spiritual show. He prayed a simple prayer. He offered God honesty, confession, and worship. He left the church right with God. We need to ask ourselves, what was the difference between these two men? What is the difference between them and us? The difference was in the attitude and condition of their hearts. One was full of himself and thought he needed nothing more. 
the other knew he was nothing and possessed nothing and he humbles himself before God and he is blessed how do you come to church how do you see others around you when you get to this place how do you see others around you who don't do the things to your standards how is your praying when you leave church do you feel better about yourself if that is all you get and you come and you leave and you feel good then you've missed it it has also missed you or when you leave do you feel as though you have had a spiritual bath you feel as though you have been bathed in the word and that the spirit has somehow washed you do you feel as though you've been honest before the Lord open about your sins and willing to call on him by faith instead of judging others are we content to leave them with the Lord if we are his children he will deal with the errors in their lives he will deal with the errors in our lives we need to remember that Jesus came not to save the righteous, but the sinners. We need to remember that Jesus offered the sinners love. Because when others were outcast, Jesus embraced them. We need to take stock of where we are as church, as children of God. We need to understand what it is we're called to. I invite you now to turn to hymn 490, hymn 490. 